Welcome back everyone to another episode of Tell a Friend. I have to tell you, when I started this podcast, my mission statement was to entertain, to educate and to uplift. And this episode certainly meets all of those objectives, because this past weekend I had the absolute honour of interviewing the remarkable Lord Simon Woolley. And in our long-ranging interview we discussed everything from the coronavirus pandemic, his journey into politics, and what it's like to be a Lord. This is my interview with Lord Simon Woolley. Simon Woolley, thank you for joining us on Tell a Friend. I'll begin by introducing you to my listeners. You're the founder and director of Operation Black Vote. You're the advisory chair of the government's race disparity unit, and you're a crossbench peer. Well, you have been since October, 2019. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Now, could you begin by telling me the origin story of Operation Black Vote and your journey into politics? Yes, well, they are parallel journeys in, in many ways. Uh, my entry into, into politics and the setting up of Operation Black Vote. I think, Brian, it comes from a sense of um, seeing deep racial injustice. Uh, and then being at a moment where you say to yourself, I need to act. I need to act. I need to make a difference. Uh, I can, we can. And then that galvanizes you into a plan. I guess the catalyst for Operation Black Vote occurred some 26, 27 years ago, after the death of a young black man called Wayne Douglas, who died in the police station. And after a, an inquiry, nobody was held accountable. After that tragic death, there were meetings. And after one of those meetings, a, I guess a street riot ensued in Brixton. And people were frustrated, people were angry, but once again, a, a black young man went into police custody healthy and came out in a body bag. And they tore the streets down. But post that riot, a lot of black leaders came together and said, look, it's no good us tearing down our own streets. We want to hold the police to account, the, the politicians to account. Then we need power. We need to be in a position where we're not asking for justice, but demanding it. Back then, there was a great sense of feeling that the black voters, the black community were politically powerless. People, things were done to us and we were powerless to push back. It was my job as a young activist, maybe not much older than yourself, to do the research and just see actually our position of power. Because although we felt powerful, we actually believed that we were in such large numbers in inner city areas, that we did have political power. We believe that. It was my job to prove it. So I spent eight to nine months doing the research. And then I called all the activists together, people like Lee Jasper, Rita Patel, Derek Hines, Ashok Viswanathan. And there was a bit of a eureka moment because what I was able to tell the group that the Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities, we called it back then and still do, political black, non-white. Far from being powerless, we were politically very powerful. And that was wholly focused on the maths. Even back then in 1990, we launched in 1996, but I gave the information in 95. I was able to tell the group that if black and minority communities, if the black community registered to vote and voted, we in effect could decide, I think back then it was about 70 marginal seats. You, you have to remember that back then in 95, 96, John Major had a majority of about 26 seats, wafer, wafer thin. So we said, if we vote, we can decide who wins and who loses. It was a great moment, and that's when we started. And we just burst onto the stage. The black vote will decide. The black people, the, the community loved us because there's the game changer. For the first time, really, in British politics for a long time, that politically we were saying 
We're not asking for justice. We'll decide who has the keys to Downing Street, and here are our set of demands. It was a very powerful moment. Now, how receptive were all of the political parties when you started in 96? It's a very good question, because we were shooting in the dark. We were all, we were all activists. Nobody was paid, but we just believed in what we did. You know, the politicians from all the political parties quickly recognised the potential power much quicker than our own communities did. Of course they would, because their political life depended upon it. So very quickly, we saw John Major. John Major was born in Brixton, and he quickly thought, I need the black vote, quick. And so he was saying to Black Britain, I'm a Brixton boy. I'm a Brixton boy, born and bred in Brixton. Uh, Tony Blair was saying, I've been an anti-racist fighting for Nelson Mandela from the get-go. Uh, same too with Paddy Ashdown for the Liberal Democrats. So they were, in many ways, superficially appealing to the, to the black community. I, I do think, however, the Labour Party did make one significant promise, gesture, that changed Britain in many ways. Because Jack Straw rang our office during that election campaign and said, could we host a press conference for him? And at that press conference, he said, if Black Britain vote for me, I will ensure that the black community have a public inquiry into the racist murder of Stephen Lawrence. And of course, that was a big deal. We've been campaigning for that for, for many, many years. So for him to promise that, deliver it, and then change the legislation because of that inquiry, that was something born out of black struggle. Now, how did you uh, actually begin the organization? Was it crowdfunding or was it just community activism? Community activism. I mean, it was old school, on the street, placards, leaflets. I mean, you know, uh, morning, day, night, knocking on doors, holding meetings. It's very, very exciting. Uh, I do remember our first meeting, our first public meeting, it was in Croydon. Croydon was a marginal seat. I think it had a, the sitting MP had a major, majority of about 30 votes. So it was very, very narrow. And I remember a packed Croydon town hall. And the TV cameras were there and the, the hall was packed. Um, and it was the first time in public in front of the cameras that politicians from all the political parties, it was a Hustings meeting, were, were held accountable to black voices. And you saw, all these, you saw all these candidates sweating under the lights, being told, what are you doing about this? What are you doing about that? If you want our vote, we knew we had something. It was raw. We never had any money. We, we begged, borrow, and stole where, where we had to. Um, there, there was a, two brilliant advertising guys, um, John, John Daniels and his partner. Oh, gosh, I forget his name in a second. I hope I remember. Anyway, they did the advertising for us. They did the advertising campaign for us, pro bono. And it was a fantastic campaign. They, they said to us, look, black people are not voting. They feel powerless. So we have to grab them by the juggler and we have to also arrest the politicians to our cause. So we had, this, we had these giant billboard posters of each of the political leaders. On, on each one, it had their face and it had their telephone number. Underneath their office telephone number, and it said, very simple. Imagine if one million black people call up Tony Blair, call up Paddy Ashdown, uh, call up um, John Major and tell him what we think. <laughs> did. But um, what they wanted to do was have that first political step of engaging, of demanding. And um, I, was, I was very proud of that. Now, bringing it up to today, what does Operation Black Vote do? What are the initiatives it does to fulfill its mission statement? Well, very much what we did back then, actually, is that the mission hasn't changed a whole deal. Yes, we've become a bit more sophisticated, I hope, uh, and we punch harder, higher. But the, 
the three core elements remain. Number one, political education, understanding how the system works, and how we access it, uh, understanding the levers of power, political participation. You know, in the Operation Black Vote team, we see ourselves as disciples of Dr. Martin Luther King. Dr. King had a dream, we know that, but he also had a plan. Step one of that plan was voter registration. Politics is a numbers game, and we have the numbers. We still don't realize just how powerful we are. When you, when you mobilize the numbers, you're not asking, you're demanding, as I said before. And the third element is, is uh, was, will always be representation. We said, back then, as we do today, anywhere there are decisions that affect our lives, we should be around the decision-making table. And when we are, better policies happen, better societal changes occur. People feel inclusive, people feel empowered. But we have a society in which, as the phrase the, the goes at the moment, we're all in this together, but we're not unless we're around the table. And on that latter project, for the last 24 years, we've been nurturing talent. So we've been holding MP shadowing schemes, leadership projects, local leadership projects. And, you know, some of those successes I'm very, very proud of. More than 120 magistrates. These 120 magistrates, when we did these schemes over 10 years ago now, uh, these individuals have given more than a thousand years of public service. On average, each one does 10 years. Transform transforming uh, our local magistracy, giving people hope that justice will be delivered. Uh, MPs, 10% of all BME MPs are from Operation Black Vote, and about four or five uh, black, uh, black or Asian mayors, such as um, Marvin, Marvin Reed, Anna, Anna Rothery, and, uh, and, and others, you know, in very, very senior positions, Joe Edgerford, uh, in senior positions now, actually, you know, running budgets of 500 million pound plus. Now, over the years, you've worked very closely with successive governments. And um, looking recently at Theresa May's government, you worked very closely with them with the race audit. Would you say politicians have become more engaged with the issues and recommendations that you've raised with them as the years have gone on? Well, I think I've been nearly 25 years uh, of, of activism. And, you know, we're non-partisan. We have a vision of a world our society free of race inequality. And we'll work, with, we'll work with politicians who want to work with us. We'll challenge politicians who don't want to work with, with, with us. And um, over the years, people have recognized that on those shared agendas of equality, of justice, of unleashing talent, some politicians get it better than others. Uh, Theresa May was one of those politicians that said, look, I can do certain things, and I believe that in other areas you can help me. And in particular, closing those racial disparities. We put that idea to a, a race disparity audit, and she said, what's not to like? Uh, and she ran with it, frankly. She said, look, the mantra is, first and foremost, lay bare the uncomfortable truths. The fact that from uh, cradle to grave, there's race penalties in hospitals. Tragically, we're seeing that rolled out at, at the moment. Uh, in schools, in housing, in the criminal justice system. Penalties for no other reason than the color of your skin or the religion that you hold, or sometimes both. And she said, let's lay them bare and have a plan. Explain, explain these disparities, these gaps, or change through policy. I'm, I'm thankful that Boris Johnson hasn't kicked it into the long grass. I think uh, many of his team are data driven. And the data says, look, these are the gaps. What are you going to do about it? And so fingers crossed we can plow ahead because, as we've seen, now more than ever, we need to have a plan to acknowledge the racial disparities. And two, uh, what is the action to close it, close those gaps? 
Now, do you ever find it challenging when communicating with uh, politicians of all the parties, when they're very happy to talk the talk with you, that their actions don't necessarily match with what they aim? Brian, I'm always frustrated. I have every right, we have every right to be frustrated. Because when you see lives lost, when you see talent uh, not elevated, when you see potential excluded from our education system, it makes me angry. No other way of putting it. And sometimes I get politicians who say, yes, 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 what's not to like? Uh, and then the implementation, the journey from an idea to implementation is like pushing a massive boulder uphill with one hand sometimes. But, in, you know, I think we've learned that, and I'm sure you will as a journalist, podcaster, activist, we never give in. It's, it's in our DNA. Um, and sometimes we have to pivot. Sometimes we have to... Uh, reconfigure, but until the job is done, we're not done. Now you've worked with Reverend Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, and even Naomi Campbell. And my question to you is, how do you think these collaborations have helped Operation Black Boat in furthering their message? Mm. Well, well, these are global leaders, all three of them, icons. And uh, it is an honor, an honor to work with with those and and others, as it's been with Theresa May, as a matter of fact. I mean, you know, she made mistakes, not grappling with Windrush as it emerged. I think she will regret for a very long time. And she has to own that. But um, I think she's a, she's a, a, in a, in a, at heart, she's a decent woman. And it was a pleasure establishing the race disparity audit and seeing how ministers had to respond. You know, working with those icons that, that you as a young scholar, you know, reading about Jesse Jackson on the balcony with Martin Luther King, keeping hope alive, presidential candidate twice, easily the best. Uh, Sharpton ran for president. I mean, he is the, I think Sharpton's probably the greatest orator that, I, that I've ever heard. Even, even better than Barack Obama, and that takes some beating. Uh, and he's a friend. And we collaborate. We collaborate because, because we're all on a mission. And Naomi Campbell is probably the most famous model in the world. Too often pilloried by a, by a racist, misogynist press. And yet, more often than not now, she dedicates her time, her money, her energy, her, her friends to deliver racial justice, gender equality across the world, particularly in Africa. Her fashion for relief raises hundreds of thousands of pounds on a yearly basis. And so I'm honored to be working with people like them. I'm actually honored to be working with someone like you, Brian. I mean, you reached out as a young man and said, look, you know, can we have a conversation? And for me, this process is succession planning. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. So you can't have this seat just yet. But I want you to want this seat. I want you to want a position of power where you can lead, where you can inspire. I mean, you can do that without the seat, as you are. But we, you have to nurture and support a younger generation, men and women, to come forward and own the leadership roles that is their destiny. Now, I want to backtrack on the political blackness um, message we were talking about just a second ago. What is your opinion of political blackness and its effectiveness today? Well, it's as important now as it was back then. And the, if you like, the, the, the colonial divide and rule has been a great detriment to the cause of tackling race inequality. Actually, it began... I guess in its high point was after 9-11, because after 9-11, people wanted to blame Muslims and other ethnic groups said, religious groups said, we're not Muslim, we're not Muslim. And there was this divide and rule. And, and then people would say, you know, we're not, we're not black, we're Asian, we're... And what it did was is that it diluted that 
that cause because whether you are Muslim, Sikh, African, Caribbean, Asian, uh, racial discrimination by and large is based upon color of your skin and, and religion too in, in, in other aspects, but people of color. So if people of color, political black, you do one of two things. One, you still, you can still articulate the fact that you might be, you might be Nigerian, you might be, you might be Jamaican, you might be Bayesian, you might have, you know, all these different religions. So you support all of that, but you come together with this one voice to say together we demand race equality. And it's been diluted. We now have to say black and minority ethnic, so we people understand. But our core message is for us to be tight together. Uh, and in that tightness that we can articulate our kaleidoscope of difference, we welcome that. Uh, we don't, it's not, that's not what divides us. We, we come together as this great union of, of wonderful people. Now, to play devil's advocate on that, um, a concern that I hear from a lot of mainly younger black and brown uh, individuals, that they say that the political blackness mantra creates a monolith of people that aren't white. So then it frames whiteness as a default. So what would you say to those people? Mm. I would say that in a, in a world of white supremacy, you need a political black pushback. Because, because um, that white supremacist narrative that sadly is all pervasive. And it's this contract, like a racial contract, is not just for white people, but people of color also internalize that. Um, I think probably um, Kehindri Andrews puts it better than, than, than I could. But you know, one of the things that I often say to people to understand, to understand the white supremacist narrative, global, the global narrative, is to ask but one question, and that is, what is the best, what is the best beauty selling product in the world today? Skin lightning cream. And that tells us, that tells us right there, the, the, the global narrative of what is good and what is bad. And this is, I'm not, I'm not juxtaposing uh, a, a conflict. What I'm demanding is this white supremacist, by definition, is dismantled, so we're all equal. But unless you name it, it's difficult to do anything about it. And those that are privileged by it don't even know they're privileged. They don't even know that for no other reason than their color of their skin, they will not be stopped, searched, and humiliated at the same rate as we will. Now, I wanted to talk about the recent COVID-19 pandemic that we're in. In the past few weeks, life as we knew it has been radically changed, uh, probably forever. Right. Uh, one thing that's come out of this pandemic is the shocking fact that black and minority ethnic individuals have been disproportionately affected by this crisis. Yeah. And we're seeing that in the death rates. What action could the government and opposition parties take to mm. address this issue? Sure. You know, well, we're talking about these global disparities, right? Uh, these, these entrenched inequalities. And when you have a deadly virus like COVID-19, that those disparities are amplified. When I see that nearly 70% of the medical health workers who have lost their lives, fighting to save lives, are from black and minority ethnic communities. I want to weep, but we all should be deeply, deeply alarmed by that fact. And it's not just the, the frontline 
hospital workers, it's also the care workers uh, in, the, in the care homes, the bus drivers, the shop assistants, those in the, those in the gig economy, that unless they go out to work, they don't get paid. And black and minority ethnic communities are disproportionately on the front line and in that precarious workspace. So when we talk about these race penalties, they become tragically amplified during this virus. So my first ask to the government is acknowledge this disparity. Acknowledge the fact that we're dying at a greater rate than other people. So if we're in this together, why is that happening? If you don't acknowledge it, then you can't do anything about it in an effective way. The second point is, and then the doing then translates to one. Those on the front line must be protected. I don't want anybody, black or white, being on the front line of COVID-19 and not having the proper protection. The second thing is, if people are on that front line are, have underlying health elements, their age, diabetes, or anything else, they should be taken away from it. Now, in the past two days, we've seen uh, the government agreed to uh, have an inquiry into this disproportionate amount of death in the Black and Asian communities. And according to a Guardian report, out of, yeah. out of 53 NHS staff that they surveyed, 68% of them were BAME right. and had died right. because of this. Right. So there's clearly an issue there. And they've been mounting pressure from campaigners, from opposition uh, parties to get the government to publish the report that they do. Do you think right. that that report that they publish will reassure BAME communities that the government is actually taking this issue seriously? Well, I hope so. I mean, you know, this is, this is a matter of life and death. And those that are dying then can't save lives. So it's a double whammy. But it's not just those on the direct front line. You have to understand too, the data also shows that within this COVID-19 tragedy unfolding, uh, the data shows that black and minority ethnic communities will have a greater impact financially on their income and losing jobs. That's a fact. So present danger, health, but also in the, in the medium and long term, there will be these race penalties that could take us back a, a generation unless we acknowledge it. The other, the other point is, of course, is that with the school, we, you know, us parents with our kids at school, uh, we're worried. We're worried if they don't take exams and the teachers have to, have to predict the grades because historically, when that's been done in the past, lo and behold, black kids get lower grades. When it's blind, they get better grades. So what is the government's response to mitigate, to mitigate the racial penalty that students have, which is their future, future grades to where they will go on in life, that they can be assured that they won't be downgraded because historically that has occurred. Now, I want to move on to talking about the recent Labour report that was leaked. Um, yeah. So we had this leaked internal report that showed MPs such as Diane Abbott, Clive Lewis and Dawn Butler having been targeted by some of the uh, internal members of staff within the party. What was your reaction to this report? Well, my jaw dropped. Um, I was desperately, desperately sad. First, you need to understand this. For many years, the most senior black female politician in the Labour Party has been the most vilified politician by some margin. I mean, if there was like 20,000 abuse, misogynist, racist abuse, Diane Abbott would receive about 70% of all the MPs. I mean, it's shocking, shocking, shocking. So if that isn't bad enough, to have that type of abuse come from your own senior, senior colleagues, is breathtaking. The Labour Party, in its inquiry, not just to the leak, but in terms of who said what, the black community will not forgive the Labour Party 
unless their address is full on and those found culpable thrown out of the party. Unequivocal. If you've been found guilty, you're out. It's not acceptable for the most senior, senior black politician to be vilified in this way. What other black women, what other black women will follow Diane Abbott's footsteps if they know as they rise the ladder, this is what they can expect? Now, we often hear a lot of um, discussion about racism in the Conservative Party and on the right in general. Do you think this report addresses the need for a dialogue to begin about the racism on the left? Well, we've got to, we've got to deal with We've got to deal with anti-Semitism. We've got to deal with racism in all the political parties. They're all culpable, frankly. Uh, they all have an infrastructure that, that struggles to, one, recognise talent, to, to, to fully recognise the, the people they're seeking to serve. And I don't know. It, listen, this isn't rocket science. That there's, there's 50% of black people still not voting. The first party to recognise that going forward, looking at the looking at looking at um, the numbers, that any political party that want, wanting to secure the keys to Downing Street will need to engage with our communities. The first party that does genuinely to have an inclusive, representative, every single level of the party will win the hearts and minds of black people. And Brian, before I forget, I remember the guru's name who did the advertising for us back in 1996. It was Trevor Robinson. So Trevor Robinson and John Daniels. John Daniels sadly passed away. What a dynamic duel they were. Trevor's still doing his advertising, by the way. Trevor Robinson. But what they just they just lit the torch paper for Operation Black Front. Now, during your career, you've been showered with many awards and recognitions for your work and your activism. But last year, you received two of the highest recognition in the UK. You're trying to embarrass me now, aren't you? You're going to embarrass me now. You received a knighthood and you also became a lord. You became Lord Simon Woolley of Woodford. What did you think when you got the news? Well, let me just say this first of all, that, um, that you, it's really very important to have a vocation, have a mission in life. And I would hope people want to change the world, but you know, making money is fine as long as it's not naked. Ambition, uh, and you can do great things in many, many areas. But I've been brought up by my mother and great colleagues around, uh, including those you mentioned before. Do what you do because you think it's the right thing, and you believe that you can make a difference. Whatever you do, don't do these things for awards because you're doing it for the wrong reason. And so for 24 years, I had no awards. I mean, it's fine, you know. It, it, Lee Jasper once told me, one of the founders of Operation Black Vote, uh, this is thankless, so don't wait for any thanks. But 24 years later, uh, waiting for, not waiting for those buses, but, but you know, metaphorically waiting for buses, two big ones come. <laughs> and and the first one was difficult because I personally, I couldn't take an honour. I couldn't take an honour with the word empire in it. And that's a personal decision. Um, and, and nobody should be, have to wrestle with whether or not they take an honour for their life's work. Nobody should wrestle with it. But many black people do because of the word empire. They should take it out. Order of the British Excellence. Uh, thankfully, the honour of mine is a um, knight thistle, uh, with no mention of empire in, thank heavens. And the Queen got the, this archaic sword and did chop my ear off and knighted me. Great honour for me and my family. And then some months later, the Prime Minister said that we'd like to elevate you to the House of Lords as a crossbench peer. It's a great honour. And I hope, that, I hope that I can be a quiet role model. No, not, so it's not about me, it's about what I can do. I hope that I can encourage and I can inspire. And above all, above all, Brian, that I can make a difference. Because you know, when you're given roles, when you're given a platform, you're duty bound. You're duty bound to serve. <clears throat> you're, and in serving, 
it's, it's a great honor. It's a great feeling that I get up every day thinking, how can I change the world? And I guess and I would just say, you know, in these closing remarks, that uh, we're at a crossroads right now because this, tra this tragedy taking lives is awful. But as awful as it is, it gives us the opportunity to rethink our society, the way we do things, who we value, what our priorities should be, leveling the playing field, ensuring that those doing back-breaking work on the front line, the so-called essential workers, are properly valued. This gives us that opportunity. It also gives us an opportunity to listen to the birds and to spend time with our family. We must seize these precious potential and, and, and run with it. Now yourself and Dame Floella Benjamin um, are one of the few minority lords in the chamber. And as you addressed, there has been a bit of pushback from especially the black community with some people rejecting uh, honors that they've been given and rejecting uh, the lordship. Do you think they're justified in rejecting it or do you think we need more black people to enter those established chambers? Mm. But they shouldn't have to wrestle with that. They shouldn't have to wrestle with being honored. We have one system that honors greatness, that honors excellence. We're forced to wrestle with it and we shouldn't. I'm not making a judgment whether you accept it or not, that's personal. But everybody that's been offered it deserves to be offered it because of the excellent work that they've done. And uh, I'm sorry that, 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 like me, we have to wrestle with it and unpick it and see, because let's be clear about this, Brian. There's nothing good uh, that came out of the empire. Nothing. No, the, let me say, the only thing that came, the, the, of, of note that came out of the empire is that we survived. And we survived to fight. And we survived to tell the story. But the tenants of the empire that obliterated millions of people, that stole land, the, 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 the legacies of such, we are still wrestling with today. We have a, we have a white supremacist society that deems us less than. Nothing's good from the empire, so why are we in the honor system? Now, to finish off, I wanted to end with a round of statements which I'd like you to complete. So the first one is, the biggest misconception about me is? That I can walk on water. <laughs> I am most proud of? I'm most proud of waking up in the morning and then believing that I can change our world. My biggest regret is? My biggest regret is that my, my mother who, who fostered and adopted me uh, was not alive to see her son be knighted by the queen and be ennobled as a Lord of Woodford. My advice to today's youth is? Be the best you. You know, you know, that I, I've listened to Al Sharpton, he does a morning sermon, but you know, every other sermon that Sharpton gives at five o'clock in the morning, it's about the self and about being focused and about being brilliant and about being resilient and about being, making a difference. And, you know, in truth, most people are lazy. I mean, you know, we, 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 we want to cut corners. We, you know, don't want to finish a book. We don't want to, don't do that. Don't, you, when you wake up feeling, this is the best I can be because I've made, it's a wonderful feeling. I, I, I struggle, I wrestle with it, but I strive for it. I think that, I think if your listeners can, can wake up in the morning and believe they can do almost anything. I, I, I'm down with that. Lord Simon Willey, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you.